Um, next, next talk we're going to hear about um, is by Mike Donovan. It's uh, a look at terrestrial arthropods and their relationship to plants. And Mike, um, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be giving an overview of some of the terrestrial arthropods that are found during the Chasmobian, um, as well as talk about how they were interacting with plants at this time. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here is a map of the occurrences of terrestrial arthropods during the Casimovian. Um, you can see that they are mostly dispersed across the equatorial regions um, in North America, um, United States, as well as mostly Western Europe and some occurrences in Northern Africa. Um, so this map here includes occurrences of myriapods, arachnids, and insects. Uh, next slide, please. So if you look at the number of occurrences of terrestrial arthropods during the um, different parts of the Pennsylvanian, um, so the Casimovian is the third bar here. Um, I forgot that the axis over here, but the, there's about 100 occurrences, um, at least as of 2018, there's been some more since then, but the Casimovian doesn't really have a great record of um, terrestrial arthropods compared to other parts of Pennsylvania. However, using the fossils we do have, plus uh, range through um, from early in the Pennsylvania and later in the Pennsylvania, as well as using the plant record and arthropod herbivory, we can get a pretty good idea of what arthropods on land were doing at this time. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna give a quick overview of some of the uh, terrestrial, or terrestrial arthropod groups that were prevalent during the Casimovian. Um, so first are the myriapods. Um, so this includes millipedes and centipedes. Um, so millipede fossils are around in the Casimovian. Um, millipedes are a really ancient group and are really important detritivores. Um, they typically feed on leaf litter and are really important in processing this as a food source. Um, so here's some from the Kinney Brick Quarry in New Mexico. And of course, there's also, as mentioned in the last talk, Arthropleura, which was the huge um, millipede that was around at this time. Next slide, please. So there were also really diverse arachnids at this point. Um, the fossil record of arachnids is not great. They're pretty rare. Um, when they appear, it's great. You can see this beautiful um, fossil spider over here, this photo. But there were lots of mites, um, represented mostly by their feeding damage. Um, there is scorpions, there's um, lots of groups that you would expect to see based on things that are still alive today, uh, whip scorpions, uh, harvest men, or daddy long legs. Um, next slide, please. So here's some photos of some of these nice fossils from this time. So there's a whip scorpion. Um, so these are predators of other arthropods typically, um, known for their uh, whip-like tail that you can see preserved in this fossil. Um, next slide. And also probably the most common arthropod fossil during the Chasmobian is the, are the trigonotarbids. Um, these are a really ancient group. They appeared in the late Silurian and persisted through to the early uh, Permian. So these look kind of similar to spiders. Um, they don't have spinnerets though, so they can produce uh, silk. Um, and these were also predators uh, similar to spiders and many other arachnids. Um, so this one is also from the Kinney Brick Quarry, um, which is, has a lot of the arthropod record at this time. Next slide, please. So here are occurrences of fossil insects from the Chasmobian. Um, so they mostly occur in the U.S. and parts of Europe, um, as well as some occurrences in Northern Africa. So um, they are not super diverse at most of these sites. Um, most of them just have a few occurrences. Um, so if you go, uh, go to the next slide, please. So this is a graph of insect uh, Lagerstatten. So this graph is based on um, sites with at least 100 described species. So you can see I added a little gray bar here across the Casimovian. And there's not actually any Lagerstatten based on that definition of 100 described species during this time. Um, so there's nothing like a Maison Creek or a common tree um, or Elmo, Kansas, for example, um, that we have in other times. Um, however, there are some sites that have a nice uh, record of fossil insects. 
Um, next slide, please. So I pointed out a couple ones here. Um, Kenny Bear Quarry um, has a lot of fossils as well as um, there's many in, so that's in New Mexico, US, and then there's many in uh, Morocco. So these are mostly roaches um, that have the most species described at these sites. And like I said before, most of the other places are kind of one-off occurrences. Um, so not really a strong record at any individual site. Uh, next slide, please. So next I'm gonna talk about the hexapods. So these are include the insects, um, as well as the entomates, which are um, older, old, uh, tiny little um, microarthropods, typically like Columbula or Diplura, um, they usually live in soil. So the insects at this time um, during the Pennsylvanian were actually really diverse. So the early fossil record of insects is really poor. Um, there's a, some contentious records in the Devonian, and then there's a long gap of 60 million years from the middle Devonian to the end of the Mississippian with no insect fossils. Then suddenly, the, with the appearance of uh, fossil wings, um, the record really explodes um, in diversity of insects. So um, the insect record includes wingless forms like Archeognatha, uh, Monura, and Zygotoma. Um, the, one of the most common groups of winged insects during the um, Pennsylvanian is the Paleodictyopteroids. So this includes Paleodictyoptera, Mexicoptera, Daphnoptera, and Diclyptera. Um, so these are um, herb herbivorous insects. Um, they had a lot, a wide diversity of forms um, from very robust wings in the Paleodictyopteran to the Megasicoptera, which had much thinner wings, to the Daphnoptera, which had um, wings that they could fold over their backs, uh, similar to some modern insects, as well as the Diclyptera, which actually had uh, reduced back wings. Um, then there were the, uh, the Paleoptera. This include things like mayflies or ancestors of mayflies, um, as well as Odanotoptera, which includes things like the famous Meganura, which were the giant dragonflies um, that are seen in a lot of reconstructions of the Pennsylvania. Um, and finally, the Neoptera. These are insects that can fold their wings over their backs. Um, and these include things like the ancestors to Orthoptera, so um, like grasshoppers, uh, include the Dictyoptera, which includes uh, the roaches. Um, and then also, importantly, the whole metabola. So these are insects that go through metamorphosis, a uh, complete metamorphosis. And these started to appear in the Pennsylvania also. Next slide, please. Um, so here's some nice pictures of fossil roaches from this time. Um, so a lot of these are widespread. Um, this is based on the York Snyder's work here. Uh, so these are from on the left side, the Kenny Brick Quarry, and the right side, these are from in the US, and these are from Morocco over here. Um, so these are used for, these are pretty, probably the most commonly described fossils in the Casimovian and are good for uh, biostratigraphy also. Next slide, please. So the Paleodictyoptera are the most, are one of the other really common fossils during the Casimovian and Pennsylvanian in general. So these are the insects that were piercing and sucking so they could feed on fluids on, in plants. Um, they could get pretty large. Some of them are about um, um, maybe 50 centimeters um, in diameter. So they could get pretty, pretty massive. Um, next slide, please. So now for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on the interactions of arthropods with uh, plants, both in wetland environments and seasonally dry environments during the Casimovian. Uh, next slide, please. So there's lots of different ways to study insect herbivory in the fossil record or other arthropod herbivory. Um, so one way is to describe individual feeding traces. Um, so for example, this is a really common feeding trace of Phagophytognites akowskii. Um, so this is just feeding along the margin of a leaf, um, a little U-shaped uh, feeding trace. Um, so these are pretty common in the Pennsylvania and really throughout the history of arthropod interactions. Uh, next slide, please. So another way is to quantify the insect herbivory. So we use the guide to insect damage types. So when we do these types of studies, we look at a fossil leaf or a fossil plant part and see if there's any evidence of insect or other arthropod feeding on the leaf. If there is, we assign it a damage type number. 
based on characteristics of the damage. So from there, we can quantify the diversity of damage, see how it changes over long periods of time. Uh, next slide, please. We can also look at not only compression floors, but also cobalts. Um, so cobalts preserve three-dimensionally uh, preserved plants. Um, so we can actually see the, how the herbivores interacted with the plants in an extra dimension um, by taking multiple peels through the cobalt to see how the overall structure of the damage. Next slide, please. So insect herbivory can be affected by climate change, and that has been shown in the fossil record, as well as modern um, studies manipulating temperature or carbon dioxide or both for insects feeding on plants. Um, increases in CO2, CO2 can cause changes in plant nutritional quality, which can affect growth rates and survivorship of insects. Um, temperature can also cause increases in growth rates. Um, so there's lots of different factors that can change different depending on the species of insect or the species of plant. So using the fossil record, we can have natural experience, experiments to see how the plants and insects have reacted to climate changes over long time periods. Um, next slide, please. So during the Pennsylvanian, there was repeated glacial interglacial phases. And during these repeated phases, um, there were shifts in um, forests. So going from wetland forests to dryland forests, um, back and forth. So there's also an overall trend of increasing aridity from starting in the middle Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. Um, so for this part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about Macroneuroptera schoetzeri, which is a common uh, medulose and pteridosperm, which is found in middle and upper Pennsylvania forests in the tropical Pangaea. So it's from the Bashkirian to mid Gazellian in the US, uh, lower Bashkirian to lower Kazimovian in Europe and Atlantic Canada. Um, so it's around about 18 million years and con confined to wetland habitats. It features a lot of features that are typical of plants associated with dry environments, like thick cuticles and sunken somato, but it's associated with wetland habitats. Next slide, please. So there's been a lot of herbivory previously documented on the medulosins. Um, so here's some examples, mostly of margin feeding where an insect chewed along the edge of the leaf. Next slide, please. So for this part of the talk, the questions I, I'm going to be talking about are, did herbivores track suitable habitats between glacial and interglacial cycles? Um, if they did, I would, we expect to see repeated occurrences of similar habitat and post specific insect damage. Um, and how did the long term climatic trends affect feeding? Um, were drying and warming trends, which began in the middle Pennsylvanian and strengthened by the early Permian, accompanied by increased diversity of insect herbivore feeding damage? Um, so, as you'll see, a lot of these patterns are relevant throughout the Pennsylvanian, um, including in the chasm of. Um, so next question, or next uh, slide, please. So some of these localities are from the Illinois Basin. Um, so this is about a 10 million year period through the Casimovian. Um, these floors are often found above and below coal beds. Uh, next slide, please. And I also looked at floors from the Middle and Basin in Texas. Um, so these are from the Gazellian to Acellian and the Central Appalachian Basin. Um, so these are also Gazellian to Acellian. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a uh, uh, stratigraphic column of all the different floras that I looked at. Um, these are all curated at the Smithsonian. So in the Chasmobian, there's a good representation of wetland floras at this time. Next slide, please. So I found a lot of examples of arthropod herbivory on Macroneuropters. Um, a lot of it is margin feeding. So things like with chewing, moth parts could feed on the leaves, um, uh, consuming this tissue. There's also things like oviposition on the picture on the right, where an insect inserted its ovipositor, which is uh, how it lays its eggs into the leaf and probe the leaf. Um, next slide, please. So there's also a lot of pathogen damage. So this isn't made by animals, but it could be uh, fung fungi, for example, or um, bacterial or viral um, damage to the leaf. Um, and this is pretty common throughout the history of macroneuropters. Uh, next slide, please. So this graph shows 
the occurrences of individual damage types through the range of macroneuropters. Um, so one thing to notice is that for the most part, once a damage type appears, it appears over and over again at multiple levels. Um, if you look at the uppermost uh, occurrences, it has most of the different damage types um, that were found in earlier uh, beds or earlier parts of the Pennsylvania. So it appears that there's some level of ecological conservatism with these damage types. Once they appear, they're pretty, they're pretty closely associated with their host plant through long periods of time, even though this is moving through multiple glacial and interglacial cycles. Um, next slide, please. So these are examples of one of the recurring damage types. This is kind of a, a simple damage type, which is the margin feeding along the edge of the leaf. So this is sort of a U-shape cut by an insect. Um, and this appears over and over and over again at multiple levels. Uh, next slide, please. So this suggests uh, long-term associations with arthropods and pathogen. Um, so Macronoctris is really ecologically conservative taxa. Um, it's found in wetland habitats throughout its history. So during these glacial interglacial phases, there's a reassembly of wetland biomes with similar plant dominance diversity structures during successive glacial phases. Um, so this suggests uh, this ecological conservatism may have allowed for long-term relationships with these arthropods and pathogens to persist. Uh, next slide. So the response to changes in atmospheric CO2 is currently unclear. So if you look at this graph over here, this is a CO2 curve. Um, each of these on the right are diversity. So this is the, the second graph is combined damage type diversity. The third is insect damage diversity. And the fourth is uh, pathogen damage diversity. So there are some peaks with the insect diversity that correspond with high CO2 levels, um, but it's not totally clear. Um, so I think in the future, I'm, I'm starting to increase sample sizes, add new sites, and also look at full floras to see how this may um, make the pattern more clear. As I, as I collect more data. Next slide, please. So as talked about yesterday, there was a major floral turnover near the Des Moines and Missourian boundary in the Illinois basin. Um, there's a loss of the dominant lycopsids um, and the tree ferns became the dominant plant type after. So how did that affect insects? Next slide, please. So this is very preliminary. Um, this is the most well sampled sites that I have. And it does seem like there could potentially be an increase in herbivory after the um, turnover. Now, again, with this, I need to collect more data, um, use full floras, um, which I plan to do in the near future to see how that actually affects this pattern. Uh, next slide, please. So next, I'm gonna be talking about whole balls. Um, so this gives us three-dimensional looks at uh, herbivory in permineralized plants. Um, so there's things like feeding damage as well as coprolites that are found. So this is going to focus mostly on the calcium coal. Um, looking at work that uh, Conrad Lavendera and Tom Phillips did in the 90s. Um, recently, I've started looking at coal balls myself, um, and as well as uh, Scott Lackerham, who's a new grad student, a PhD student at the University of Illinois. So in the future, we'll have more to uh, present. But I'm going to give an overview of what we know about coal ball floors. Next slide, please. So here is an example of detritivory. Um, so this is boring made by mites um, from Levender et al. 1997. So these are the roots of Seronius, which is a tr uh, tree fern. Um, so the mites were boring through all sorts of tissue. Um, they're really important with uh, degrading plant tissue. Um, they break up the plant tissue, which allows microbes to enter um, because there's more surface area for them to, uh, to work with. So they're really important with this uh, breakdown of floors. Next slide, please. So here's a variety of coprolites. So the one that I think is really cool is uh, 15. So that is actually a coprolite with mite borings through the coprolite. Um, so there's multiple levels, you know, something ate plant tissue and then the, copper, uh, the mites were feeding on the actual coprolites. Um, there's also um, number 18 is trichomes from the um, seed fern Alithopterus. So it might be possible, so it's hard to tell with a lot of these if they are from detritivores or from herbivores. So one possibility is to look, that I'm planning to do in the future, is to look at floras from, compression floras from above and below the coal beds to see if I can match up herbivory to coprolites that are seen in the coal balls. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, so here's some examples of piercing and sucking. So these, this is where a insect penetrates the tissue, um, in this case of a Seronius uh, rachis, so this is called Stipitopterus, penetrates the tissue and sucks out fluids. Um, you can see on the, if you look at the right side, there's this um, dark line going into the leaf tissue. This is called the uh, stiletal trace. So this is where the actual insect inserted its stylet, which is its, its kind of long mouth part. So it's about four millimeters deep um, entering the uh, vascular tissue. Next slide, please. So this herbivory is probably made by uh, Paleodictyopteran insect. Um, they have these long mouth parts. Um, there's a lot of variation depending on the particular family, um, but there were many with smaller piercing sucking marks that match the overall shape and, shape and size of this damage. Uh, next slide, please. So next up is galling. Um, so this is from Lavendera and Phillips, 1996. Um, so this is also on Seronius. There are these galls. So galls are a type of herbivory where um, an insect larva, um, there's a, sort of a chemical reaction with the plant that causes the plant to grow tissue surrounding the insect, um, which it can feed on and live within. So this is a gall in a, a rachis of, uh, called Cipitopterus of Seronius. Um, it was possibly made by whole metabolous insects. So those are insects that have, um, they metamorphosize. Um, so there's different instar, or there's different sizes of the uh, coprolites and sides, just in instar growth. Um, the overall shape and size matches what would be expected from whole metabolous insects, but it's not possible to totally narrow it down. Um, next slide, please. So there were whole metabolous insects at this point. So here's some example of some whole metabolous larvae from the Moscovian. So um, these were starting to diversify during this time. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a reconstruction of a Seronius with showing all these different types of herbivory or antitritivory that were happening on the plant. So by using the cobalts and combining it with the uh, compression floors, we can get a pretty good idea of the variety of damage that's found on these plants. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to be talking about mixed floras. So we went through the wetland floras and the cobalts, um, and now the mixed floras, which are composed of a combination of wetland and drought tolerant plants. So these are really common in the late Pennsylvanian uh, Western Pangaea. Um, so here's an example. This is from the Kinney Brick Quarry, which is from the Kasmovian Missourian of um, New Mexico, USA. So here you can see Neuropterus, which is a wetland plant. Um, and a variety of uh, Sphenopteridium, which is more in the dryland areas. So you can see how these are found in the same beds, representing different microhabitats in the overall environment. Uh, next slide, please. So the Kinney Creek Quarry, um, as I mentioned, is from the late, is from the Casimovian um, in New Mexico. It's currently an active mine where they manufacture bricks. It's a nearshore embayment environment, uh, river delta, and a river delta prograded over that embayment. It has a seasonal monsoonal climate, um, and this is where a lot of different, there's a great uh, flora and fauna found at this locality. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we looked at herbivory on the flora at this site. Um, and we find a lot of damage that is also found in wetland forests. So things like margin feeding, um, we have a wide variety of margin feeding over here. Um, so across different, mostly seed plants. So there's things like Mechanoropterus, uh, Mixonura, um, and neuroodontopterus. Um, next slide, please. And I had to give this its own slide. Um, I think this is the nicest looking um, margin feeding I've seen in the Paleozoic. Um, so I just had to blow it up. If you look at the picture on the right, so this really illustrates these chewing mouth parts. Um, there is, it's possibly that this was made by something like a ancestral orthoptera, so uh, ancient relative of like grasshoppers, um, which were around at this time and some had chewing mouth parts. You can see these little, they're called venal stringers, the, the little veins that are kind of hanging off the edge. And that's pretty common, this sort of jagged look uh, when an insect chews through a leaf. And you can also see it's a little darker along the edge. So that's the reaction tissue where the plant actually sort of created a uh, healing tissue to, you know, to stop bacteria or viruses or whatever to, from entering it and making the plant uh, getting diseases. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
So we also have hole feeding and surface feeding also made by one of these chewing insects. Um, so just like chewing either through the leaf or chewing on the surface of the leaf um, and just consuming an upper or lower layer of tissue. Next slide, please. Um, we also have possible piercing and sucking. So if you remember in the cobalt flora where there was uh, three-dimensionally preserved piercing and sucking, piercing and sucking can occur on compression floras, but it's often a little more difficult to interpret. Um, so I'm sometimes wary to say 100% that this is piercing and sucking. It does have the overall features of piercing and sucking. There's small marks where uh, probably a paleodictyopteroid could have you know, pierced the, the, um, the tissue and sucked out some fluid. So if you look at the pictures on the right, these are along the um, mid veins of the leaf. Um, so this is actually a pretty common behavior in some modern piercing and sucking uh, mycteroid insects. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, we find overposition. So this is made when a, a female insect inserts, inserts its ovipositor and lays an egg. Um, so this is found on a stem at the Kenny Brick Quarry. Um, uh, or a branch, and there's multiple marks up and down the, um, the stem here. Next slide, please. So like in the wetland forest, we also find pathogen damage. Um, so this is Macroneuropterus on the left side here, and we find the exact same um, damage. So this, this um, pathogen damage is pretty widespread on these Macroneuropterus leaves, as well as other uh, Medulos and turtus sperms across their range, at least in the US. Um, so, yeah, these were really um, long ranging associations and wide ranging associations. Next slide, please. So, I just wanted to show um, quickly there's really low damage diversity at most of these sites in the um, Pennsylvanian, um, especially compared to most sites in the Permian that have been looked at. So I think there was a diversification of feeding strategies that was happening at this time that we can see by studying from the earlier in the Pennsylvania and through to the Permian, when there's a lot more piercing, sucking, and galling, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So this pattern is found at other sites in the Western Pangaea. So this is just a, a little figure from the Beeman Formation in the Sacramento Mountains of New Mexico. Um, you can see a lot of the same types of herbivory, like there's this margin feeding. Um, if you look at D and E, that's more of this pathogen damage. If you look at G, uh, beautiful margin feeding. H and I, there are overposition marks. Uh, next slide, please. So the herbivory on mixed floras, um, it shows that insect herbivores colonize plants in both wetland and seasonally dry environments by the Casimovian. It's possibly that this occurred earlier, but we haven't uh, looked at enough floras to really uh, talk about to say that yet, um, but I, I assume it probably extends back further. The leaf-eating insects um, exhibited a preference for pteridosperms across habitats, um, and they, you know, they were pteridosperms that lived in both of these types of environments, so they had lots of food to choose from. Uh, next slide. So sea plants seem to play an important role in the evidence, in the evolution of uh, feeding on leaves. So most Pennsylvanian uh, Folivory is associated with sea plants, particularly the Medulus and Teridosperms. In the Permian, this diversified a lot. Um, there are uh, lots of sea plants that were attacked by insects. Um, so they had a lot of, so that might also um, in, um, add to the increase in, in damage type diversity seen in the Permian. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, the Pennsylvania in general was a major time of diversification of winged insects. Um, there is, so this is the time of the uh, Paleozoic insect fauna. Um, many of these eventually ended up going extinct, especially the, for example, the Paleodictyopteroids went extinct in the Permian. Um, these were the piercing and sucking insects. But there are the ancestors of a lot of insects that we know about, to, that we see today. Um, for example, the whole metabolous insects were starting to diversify during the Pennsylvania. Um, there's also the proliferation of modern forms of arthropod herbivory. Um, so this includes things like external foliage feeding, piercing and sucking, galling, um, pollen and spore feeding. Um, so this was all insects were kind of, you know, figuring out all the different methods that they feed on plants today. Um, there was low damage diversity on compression floras in both wetland and seasonally dry habitats. Um, but we know now that insects had colonized plants across multiple habitats by the Casimovian. Um, seed plants, particularly the metalist and 
um, turtle sperms were the preferred food, food source of uh, insects that fed on leaves. Um, we see long-term associations between plant and damage types on uh, Mechoneuropterus, which might be evidence of ecological conservatism. Um, anecdotally, I think this is a broader pattern that I've noticed on other plants, but I need to collect more data on this. And finally, um, the effects of climate change and forward turnover are not completely, are not really understood well during the Pennsylvanian yet. Um, I'm planning to collect a lot of more data on full foras to really test this. Um, if you look at the, I, one thing I noticed about the Paleozoic is it's a, because of the lower diversity of damage, it's a little trickier to figure out what's happening. If I look at Cenozoic floras, um, like for example, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary and asteroid hits Mexico, there's a decrease in insect damage types. Then there's an increase, they recover in a certain number of millions of years. Here, trying to link this to climate or link it to the habitat change has been a little trickier. And I think we just need to collect more data. So if there's a, you know, Casimovian workshop number two, um, I'll have an update. Uh, next slide. Uh, thanks for everyone for watching. Thanks for our funding sources and um, people who have helped with this talk. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mike. <clears throat> Most interesting, although I've worked with Mike, a lot of this was new to me. So uh, <laughs> I appreciate the stuff you're doing. Um, uh, send me your questions or wave your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll get you. Um, I, I have a question, Mike, about uh, Sandra talked about sampling and you know, the more you sample, the more, the more you get. And um, I wonder if you've uh, got any sense of what kind of diversity you see when you look at small versus large samples and whether you pick up a lot of unusual little types if you, if you have a huge sample or whether it's, it stays pretty much monotonous. Yeah, so th there's actually, there, it really seems to be low diversity through all the sites I've looked at in the Pennsylvania. Like, I mean, if I have a really tiny sample size, then you, know, you don't pick up all of the things. But like when I looked at really big collections, it's not like I'm finding some huge new diversity of feeding types. Um, it stays pretty consistent throughout, at least from like the middle Pennsylvanians or late Pennsylvanian. I haven't looked at a lot of early Pennsylvanian herbivory. Um, however, most of the quantitative things I've been doing were focused on Macroneuropterus, so I was looking at one uh, plant. So that's why I really think I do need to expand it to full foras um, to get a better sampling and see how maybe, you know, climate or other things, other environmental changes may be affecting the insects at this time. Can you tell uh, um, detritivory from herbivory you know, very easily? So that's a good question. So in the compression fossil record, uh, yes, usually. So if um, there is herbivory, so example, if there's margin feeding, on a compression for a uh, fossil, there should be a reaction rim along the area where it's damaged, um, which is a response to the, the damage happening to the plant. So that shows that the plant was alive when it happened. Um, in the coal balls, it's pretty tricky. So for the most part, as far as I understand now, not really. Um, however, one idea I had is that if I look at forests from below the coals or above the coals and compare the copper lights in the coals or in the coal balls to the herbivory that's happening on the compression forest, like on the leaves. Um, for example, there's allothopter, there's copper lights that are filled with allothopter spits. Now, are they finding these on the ground, like just dead leaves, or are they feeding on a lot of tissue? If I find a bunch of allothopters herbivory on the compression forest, I think that might point to that this was happening with living tissue in the coal balls. Um, they, interesting, like millipedes, you know, despite, you know, we look at leaf litter, it looks the same garbage on the ground, but millipedes often actually have preferences for particular, um, types of leaves or plant parts in the litter. So like, if I find a copper light that has a single type of, um, plant tissue in it, it doesn't necessarily point to herbivory or, uh, detritivory, unfortunately. Great. I have three more questions here. I've got one from Spencer, one from... Ron Martino or one from John Wilson. So take it away, Spencer. Let me, uh, so Mike, it's, it sounds like the record is not good enough to really know if anything big happened at, in the Casamovia with arthropod herbivory or whatever. Am I, is that the correct conclusion? I don't think so. I think, so currently um, what I've collected quantitatively have been based on a single very uh, common and widespread plant. 
but I've started to collect data on full floors. And I think if I look at multiple floors from below, for example, like in the no Illinois basin, if I look at multiple floors from below, um, from the Des Moines and then look at multiple floors from the Casimovian or from the Missourian, I think there is a potential that there will be differences seen. For example, just sort of anecdotally in the COBOL record, there appears to be an increase in mite boring above in the, the um, plants or, or in the COBOL floors above this um, major turnover. Um, so that hasn't really been quanti uh, quantified rigorously or anything like that. But I think these patterns could be kind of picked up with bigger sample sizes. If they exist, I mean, there could be, I, I think there must be some change because these are like, insects are often intimately linked with the plants that they feed on. So if, so there's not a lot of evidence, there's less evidence of feeding on the uh, major arborescent lycopods than compared to the seed ferns, for example. So I think like the, the change in the diversity or the change in the, the structure of these forests has had to have had some effect on the insects. Okay. Ron Martino. Yes, uh, great talk, Mike. Uh, okay. just a quick question. Uh, can you make the distinction between uh, bite marks from arthropleurids versus some of the other uh, types of uh, insects that were around? And uh, if so, does it reveal anything about a preference uh, for certain types of plants in their diet? So not really. So it's pretty tricky with a lot of the types of external foliage feeding. So things like margin, feeding on the margins of leaves or whole feeding, it's often pretty tricky to link that with a specific um, group, uh, insect or otherwise. Um, most millipedes are detritivores. Um, so if I do find evidence of herbivory, so there's something that suggests the plant was alive when it was happening, I usually assume it most likely wasn't a millipede. It's not, it's not possible to completely rule that up, but it's more likely to be an insect. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little tricky, but there, there are you know, different lines of evidence you can kind of use to rule certain groups out in some cases. Thank you. Thanks guys. Okay, John Wilson. Hi, Mike. Really great, really great talk. Really beautiful photos and really interesting data. Um, I have a question about um, calamitalians. So horsetails today, so equisetum accumulates silica in its stems and uh, equisetum can be, you know, 10 weight percent silica. And one possible function that people have proposed for this is that that helps reduce herbivory uh, mm -hmm. just because it's, you know, it's resistant in the stems. And there's been a long debate about the uh, Paleozoic calamitalians, whether they accumulated silica as well. And so I was wondering, do you ever see um, this type of feeding damage uh, on calamitalian uh, plants, in particular calamitalian stems in your data? So there are some borings in, there's some uh, mite borings. So those are probably detritivores in the cobalts of cow mites. Um, as far as like feeding on, I think there's also been um, overposition, which isn't really feeding. Um, and I don't know of any direct, there's been feeding on some of the leaves. It's pretty uncommon though, um, especially compared to seed plants. Um, so it does occur, but yeah, something like that could be, um, part of this, um, why they're not as attacked as uh, vigorously. Because um, really, uh, in the compression fossil record, um, most of what I find, the feeding I find, is on seed plants. Great, thanks. Uh, like the next question I have in line, York, is, is to Sandra Sashet. So she's, she's ahead of you, and um, hope we have time, we'll get to, to York also. Sandra. Thank you. Um, yeah, great talk, Mike. I was wondering, how phylogenetically widespread among millipedes is the ability to eat live tissue? Yeah, I've been trying to figure that out, honestly. Um, the literature is kind of tricky. <laughs> like, I've been, I mean, I've been compiling different papers when I see them to try to figure out, like, I mean, just the getting an image of a millipede feeding on a live plant has been hard for me. It, like, they're definitely, I've found people mention like, oh, it can feed on whatever. But like, I don't even know what the damage looks like. So it has been tricky. So I don't really have an answer to that. I'm trying to figure it out, um, maybe <laughs> in a year or something. But yeah, it's, it's a tricky, because I mean, you got to look through all this like really obscure literature where people have made one little note 
in like a taxonomic paper. So it is tricky to compile this. So there doesn't seem to be a good source that I've been able to find that's really like put this together. Thank you. York, York thanks. York, if you can do yours quickly, we can squeeze it in maybe. Yeah. Only a short comment. Uh, in the Chemnitz petrified forest, an 11 meter large calamite has been found and then we cut them. Uh, this calamite is filled inside filled with corporates and additionally we have found a, CDC, a small silicified millipede in part but so there is a strong feeding on, on calamites as well it's shortly described in the paper of Oni oh. Rösler. Can I add paper on is that a published paper? Is it published, George? Is that paper published? Yeah, it's published. I, I, I will send you this, this okay. paper on the petrified first, and there it is figured. It's okay. not discussed in detail, but it is figured. Cool. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, questioners. That was great.